How fortunate and privileged we are to have with us tonight Father Donald Calloway, a member of the congregation of the Marian Fathers of the Immaculate Conception located in Stockbridge, Massachusetts. He is changing the world and he is on fire with the Holy Spirit. Father Calloway could give St. Augustine a run for his money <laughs> in terms of dramatic conversion stories. This radical transformation from atheist to high school dropout to addict to Catholic priest is pretty incredible and continues to inspire people across the world. As a child of a U.S. military family, young Donald moved from California with his parents at the age of 10 and enticed by the lifestyle of his surroundings by the age of 13 was living solely for pleasure, pursuit that would eventually lead to a downward spiral, landing him in jail, in rehab, and in complete darkness. He moved to Japan with his family on a military assignment and soon became connected with the Japanese mafia. Wanted by the Japanese government and U.S. governments, they literally kicked him out of the country in handcuffs and forever banned. They call that Sase Kanai in Cajun country. <laughs> We working on his French, y'all. <laughs> After bouts of rehab in the United States at the age of 21, the Lord had other plans for young Donnie, and he had a very dramatic conversion, one that continues to inspire. He went on to earn degrees in philosophy, theology, Marianology. He's written many academic articles and published 14 different books. He's currently working on two more. And did I mention he won an Emmy? This man is prolific for the Lord. Most recently, he changed the world by starting a movement to bring St. Joseph to the far front of our Catholic faith with his book, Consecration to St. Joseph, Wonders of Our Spiritual Father. It sold over one million copies and it's been translated into 18 different languages. In his worldwide campaign, he more accurately depicted and rebranded St. Joseph as a young, strong, vital part of the Holy Family and was instrumental in prompting Pope Francis to name a year of St. Joseph for the first time ever in Catholic Church history. It's incredible, Father. Whether it's on camelbacks, <laughs> whether it's on camelbacks or surfboards, he's traveled the world from New Zealand to Poland spreading his message. He's led many, many pilgrimages and is highly sought after as an international speaker. And so we are very honored to host him here in Cajun country. But I have to say, even with all his accomplishments and many, many accolades, know that you won't meet a more humble, gracious, down-to-earth, prayerful man. He still is a little bit feisty, but now it's all directed for the Lord. Tonight, join me in officially adopting him as our Cajun brother, and let's give a big round of applause to this international superstar of our Catholic faith. Welcome to the I'm so nervous. <laughs> Seriously, though. Wow, who y'all talking about? You talking about me? It's amazing. I mean, I put my pants on just like you do. You know, I'm nobody special. Um, as a matter of fact, I'll, I'll, I'll show that, showcase to, that to you right away. So I'm here for three days in Louisiana and um, I'm calling this my reparation tour because you know I, I got in a lot of trouble here in your part of the country back in the day. And um, actually, now I don't want to scandalize anybody if you're not familiar with my story, but I posted this on Facebook today and people are just loving it, most of them. I'll probably get some interesting comments later on. You know, 30 years ago, I got busted, thrown in jail, because I tried to run out of a Piggly Wiggly with two cases of beer under my arms, you know? <laughs> Mardi Gras time. Yeah, it didn't go too well. But you know what I did today? Jen took me to a Piggly Wiggly. Yeah, and I gave the owner a copy of my book and then I gave him a case of beer, you know? Like, reparation, sorry man, you know, 30 years old, but 
probably still good. So, yeah, so I, I have a connection with you. You're good people. You're good people. You're, you're really good people. And I, I do want to be an honorary Cajun. I, you're, you're, you're an amazing people. And your love for St. Joseph is incredible. Yesterday, we also went to the state capitol in Baton Rouge, and, and we took some pictures of that state resolution. You're the only state who has done this. You know, during the year of St. Joseph with Jen and Father Champagne, I hope I pronounced that right. You know, I'm all scared of these names, man, you know. <laughs> so wrote up this resolution that was approved by your state legislatures to, to, from all days forward now, May 1st, for the state of Louisiana, not just one parish, the entire state, is to honor St. Joseph. That's approved. You can look it up. I mean, there's no other state that has done this. You guys are incredible. So, so what I'm going to share with you tonight is not my conversion story. I know many people come thinking I'm going to give that, and I'll be giving that tomorrow to a, to a high school of almost 1,000 students tomorrow morning. That's going to be interesting. Um, you never know. You know, they, sometimes they just dead stare at you, you know, like, <laughs> you know, hello. I'm like, hello, anybody there? You know, I want to get them pumped up. You know, I'm going to convert all your delinquent little children hopefully tomorrow morning. You know? <laughs> so we'll, we'll give it a go, you know. And then tomorrow night, I'm going to Metairie. That's where I got busted. Um, so hopefully, you know, nobody there I did wrong 30 years ago shows up, but we'll see. So I'll be giving a talk there on my conversion tomorrow night. But tonight I'm going to talk about St. Joseph because he is amazing. And, you know, he's a big part of my conversion. If you are familiar with my conversion, you probably know that when I went to a Catholic church for the first time, walked in the front door, there were five Filipino Catholics, women, right? The special forces of God, right? You Cajuns are special, but the, the Filipinos probably give you a run for your money. They're, they're, some, they're some super Catholic people. So... Some of the things that they did for me was they gave me a rosary, taught me the devotional life, gave me books on saints and everything, and they brought me over to a statue in that church of St. Joseph. And their way, uh, you know, subtle way of telling me that I needed serious help in my life was to take me to that statue and say, this is St. Joseph. He's a good man. Pray to him. I understood what they were getting at. I had issues. Right, I was, I was a mess, as you say here. You're a mess, right? I was a mess, and I needed a lot of help. And I began to pray to him every day in simple ways. It wasn't anything profound or poetic. It was just simple stuff. Help me. I'm a mess. I, I, need, I need some serious getting my manhood back. And through the years, he has helped me tremendously. Even now, as a priest, 20 years, he has helped me in so many ways. But, but... When they introduced me to him in that particular statue that they brought me to, and my initial understanding of St. Joseph was somewhat deficient. Even you could say warped. I didn't have a proper really understanding of him, an image of him in my head. Because probably like you, and I won't ask you to raise your hand, though it'd be interesting to see how many would, would respond to this, when I first saw images of St. Joseph, whether it was a statue or a prayer card or an icon or whatever it was, almost all of them made him look like he was about 95 and about to croak, <laughs> right? Practically half dead. And I wasn't a scholar. I was like, eh, it doesn't make sense to me. I don't get it, right? But who am I to question this? You know, uh, it's time for me to shut my mouth and obey and, and you know, get on with the, the quest for holiness. So I didn't question it. I always found it a little odd. And so I never really looked to St. Joseph necessarily as a model for my manhood, right? That dude about to die. So I, what, what, what am I going to imitate there, right? He's probably taking afternoon naps and he's forgetful. You know? Hey, you know? so, hmm. so I thought, well, it kind of makes sense that he was old, I guess, because that's why a lot of people don't pay attention to him because he's really not necessarily a model for men in particular to imitate. So that's what I, that's the image that I had of him right? More like a grandfather of Jesus than the father of Jesus. Sometimes even a great-grandfather, you know, the images. Or some of his images, not only would he be old, but sometimes he would be effeminate looking. You ever see those? Really? I mean, it didn't look like a lily. It looked like a tulip and he it was a parasol. I mean, it looked like, dude, for reals? I mean, no wonder men don't look to you as a model of strength and manhood because you look like a girl. You ever seen those? Yeah, you have. I know you have, right? 
I mean, they're on all the Christmas cards, right? And he's in the shadow. He's the, they're like, they don't even want him to be seen. Like, yeah, hide over there in a cave. Like, yeah, a little deeper, right? In the shadows. We don't even want you too prominent out here. So again, I was just like, whatever. Seems like a pity to me that a man who was put in charge with, with raising the Messiah is presented like this. But again, I was like, man, eh, who am I to say? And on occasion, that would be supplemented with, sometimes even from the pulpit, I would hear this, right? As a... As a man wanting to become a Catholic and then becoming a Catholic, I would hear things like this. Not only was he old, you know, and all of that, and nothing wrong with old age, by the way. Please don't think I'm slamming elderly men here, okay? Don't write to the bishop, Father Calloway's a hater, he hates old men. That's not what I'm saying, yeah? No, not at all. But what I would also hear sometimes was this, and this didn't jive well with me either. I thought, eh, just not settling totally right with me, but again, who am I to question it? I would hear, he was a widower had a wife before the Virgin Mary with other children from a previous marriage. And I was always like, that's kind of a bummer, dude. I mean, no offense to anybody, you know, who's, who's gone, had a second marriage from different circumstances, but it's almost like Mary got secondhand goods. You know, I, I just felt like, gosh, that's kind of a bummer to the Blessed Virgin. I mean, she's amazing. Why wouldn't God also give this Joseph guy incredible blessings? Why couldn't he be like a virgin too? I mean, that just made a lot of sense to me. But again, I was hearing it sometimes from priests and I was like, well, I guess that's just what it is and I just gotta surrender to it and, and get on with it. But it never quite set right to me. But I let it go. And I prayed to St. Joseph every day and he helped me. Even if my image was not the greatest one, even if I couldn't imitate him, he couldn't teach me how to swing a hammer and cut through wood with an ax, maybe when he was younger, right? But now looking at the images, he can't pick up an ax. <laughs> He's barely holding that lily. It's holding him up, you know? So I just got on with it, and, but he helped me, he helped me. And then after about 15 years of priesthood, telling people to go to St. Joseph and doing priestly ministry with so many people coming up to me on a daily basis, as the good fathers could, would confirm here, with, with crises in their identity, Right? That, that's the question of our times, the, the gender issue. Father, I'm so confused. Right? I don't know what it means to be a man. And as soon as I grow a beard, they say, that's toxic. I'm offended. Right? Everybody's offended today. It's classic. It's unbelievable. Everybody's offended by everything. And people are so confused today, they don't even know what bathroom to use. Okay? <laughs> Y'all people down here, I think you got it straight. But up north, they a little confused, you know? It's unbelievable. We live in such messed up times that this is what your children are being taught, that this is normal, right? That this is the, the, the way that it is. And so people are coming up to me saying these issues, or Father, our marriage is a wreck. It's a disaster. We're on the verge of divorce, of separating. We're yelling and fighting in front of our kids. What do we do? And I was taking all of this to prayer. Because, you know, when you talk to a priest, generally, it's in, it's in his domain. It's in a church. You come for counseling, for confession, to Holy Mass. And I said to myself, these people need something. They need homework. They need to go home and be able to do something, implement a practice to renew themselves, to renew the romance in their marriage, to get the fire back with the love for Jesus, and to understand right and wrong, black and white, truth and falsehood, light and darkness. To get back to these categories, because they're real, just like mathematics is real, right? Two plus two equals four, always. Actually, nowadays, you got people saying it equals five. <laughs> I ain't making this stuff up, man. I'm serious. There are people who, who say this stuff. It's crazy times that we live in. But you, it, you know, they're, you're wrong. <laughs> well, it's the same thing today with this gender confusion. We got to get back with great love, with great compassion. We're all broken, wounded. I got my issues. Oh, tell, I'll tell you about those, right? But we got to get back to the basics. So in prayer, something came to me, not a voice or anything, but I felt the Holy Spirit prompting me to say, what those Filipino women did for you when they took you over to that statue and they told you to pray to him and all that he's done for you, you now need to reintroduce the entire world to St. Joseph. He's the missing link. He's the one that people have forgotten. He's the greatest mystery figure of Christianity and yet without him, none of it would have taken place. He saved the savior from a madman who wanted to kill him. Herod, call it Planned Parenthood today, right? 
You got to go to St. Joseph. You, they don't know him. And you've got to get him in their mind the correct understanding of him, the image of him, and his strength that that man can swing an axe and chop through wood. That, that, that God, this is amazing, that God, the divine person of Jesus Christ, wanted to be like Joseph. See, we, we've never unpacked this. We've never fully gone into the anthropological aspects of who St. Joseph was in his manhood, in his fatherhood, in his being a husband, having a chaste heart, pure eyes and intentions, that God wanted to be like him. Yes, Jesus is God, but he's the God-man. Taking on human nature, he grows up as a little boy, and he learned from Joseph. You know, think about this. Before I get into some, some serious stuff here, think about this. This is very serious, actually. Think about this. When God took on human nature, manhood in particular, he wanted to share the facial characteristics of one particular creature. Who is that? Our Lady. Right? He lived in her womb, her holy womb, for nine months. So he's going to share some kind of countenance similar to her, just like I do, my mother. When, if my mother was here, you'd be like, Father, wow, you guys look so similar. Our cheekbones, our eye sockets, it's so similar, right? All of us look like our mother on some level. It's just how it works. Jesus looks like Mary on some level. That's amazing, right? To think that God, when he took on a face, wanted to have characteristics like the Blessed Virgin. That's, that's just incredible. Does Jesus look like St. Joseph? No, because he's not his biological father. But when you see Jesus, you're seeing Joseph. How is that? Because all boys imitate their dads. I guarantee you, I guarantee you that the God-man, when he walked this planet 2,000 years ago and still some, in some mystical way in paradise forever as the God-man, he talks like Joseph he walks like Joseph. He has the accent, the mannerism of Joseph, though he knows all languages. He learned these things from Joseph. He learned how to swing an ax from Joseph. He learned how to shave wood from Joseph. He learned how to carry stones from Joseph. He treated women like Joseph treated his lady. Really, that's how it works. Jesus is not an angel. He's not some phantasm, some, some ghost. He's the God-man. You know, in, remember that episode in the, in the New Testament when we say Jesus, Jesus is lost in the temple? He wasn't lost, right? He's God. He knows where he was. They lost him. Then when they found him, after three days, it says, and he went to Nazareth and was obedient to them. God obeyed Mary and Joseph. God doesn't obey you or me. Kind of, he does for us priests at Mass when we call down the Holy Spirit to make bread into his body. Yes, okay, but I just can't, it, I don't say obey me, you know. <laughs> but Joseph, when he asked Jesus to do something, he took it as like a paternal command. Joseph and Our Lady commanded Jesus, and he did it. But the incredible thing is that in, 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 in his paternal role, Jesus wanted to, to be like him to imitate him. Jesus, in his sacred heart, this is amazing, because it comes, here's heresy, here's my statement I'm about to make. Like, super close, right? The sacred heart wanted to be like the most chaste heart of Joseph in his human formation. How can I say that? Because after that finding in the temple, what does it say? He went to Nazareth and was obedient to them and increased, Jesus, increased, and wisdom and stature before God and man. Jesus didn't increase in his divinity, right? That, that's weird. No, he's God. But in his human growth and development, just like I bet you Mama Mary in their little home in Nazareth, she took a little ruler when he grew up, he marked it six months later, right? Every mom does that for a little boy, right? Did that. He grew like a little child because he was a little child. And he increased under the care of Mary and Joseph. Do you know what Joseph's name means? The word Joseph? Etymologically, the root of it, increase. That's what Joseph means. He is the increaser. He increased the God-man in his human growth and development. And God wanted to be like him, to imitate him, to act like him, to talk and walk like him. Wow. 
Hardly any saints have unpacked this in 2,000 years of Christianity. He's the mystery man in the background that nobody has hardly paid attention to. Certain saints here and there, but not many. So you might be asking, as I did, okay, Holy Spirit, you want me to reintroduce St. Joseph to the world, I'm down with that, but how? How do I do this? I'm not so sure that I have a correct understanding of who he is. Do I present the old man icon stuff to people? I'm not so sure they're gonna be jumping on board with that. What, what do I do here? And that's when I had to go deep. Not only in prayer, but in research. And the things that I discovered were so amazing to me that that's when I knew this was totally of God and the world needed to understand this. Because if you get the family right, if you bring back the importance of fatherhood for our crazy jacked up times, we can right this ship. We can turn this thing back onto its proper course. Because how, how are men presented today in, in TV shows, in sitcoms? They're idiots. They're buffoons. They're losers. That's how they're presented. Their wife makes fun of them as they lie on the couch and you know snack on their Doritos and just a bum. The kids make fun of them in front of their, their friends, mocking their own dad. That's the modern dad. He's an idiot. That's not how it's meant to be. Oh no. He's meant to be the leader, the sacrificial leader, the servant leader who slays dragons for those entrusted to his care who is the leader of prayer in the family like St. Joseph was. Think about that. Whose role in the family unit of the earthly trinity, right? Our Lady, Jesus, and St. Joseph, an earthly trinity. Whose role was it in that family unit to lead the prayers? Was it Jesus' role? No. He, but he's God. He could have done it perfect, <laughs> right? He could have woken his mom and dad up every day and said, okay, family prayer time and you know, lead on, son, you're God, you know, it's what you do. You know? But it wasn't his role. And he didn't take that role from his mom and dad. It was theirs to do. Was it our lady's role primarily to lead the family in prayer? No, it wasn't. Wow, that's amazing because she could have done it as well. The Immaculate Conception, so united to the Holy Spirit. What beautiful prayers. But it wasn't her role primarily to lead that family in prayer. It was the role of Joseph, as is the role of every man. And you know what? He's the least member. We're talking about God, Jesus, Our Lady, not God, but an Immaculate Conception, a perfect creature. And then you got Joseph. It was his role to lead the prayers. Both his son and his wife could have done it better than him, but they let him do it. They let him lead. That's his role. How many men do that today for their families? Ah, I just leave it up to my wife, she's better at it. Buddy, that ain't the point. Your wife probably is better at it, just like Our Lady would have been better at it than St. Joseph. That's not the point, you got a role to play. And if you don't play it, there will be consequences. Sociological studies have proven this. That when it's only a mother who leads the family in prayer, taking them to church and the observance of the practice of their religion, when the children leave from that house, it's like 30% of the children will continue on with the faith. Only 30%. This ain't Father Callaway making this up because I got a Roman collar around my neck and a mic. This is the facts. But if a man leads his family in prayer, 70 to 75% of those children will continue on with the faith. Wow, big difference. No wonder we got the crisis we got today, where, isn't it interesting <laughs> that 70% of Catholics today don't believe in the real presence of Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament. Did you hear about that survey? Pre-COVID, it was 2019, North America did a survey of Catholics. 70, I think it was 71% of Catholics don't believe in the real presence of Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament. And I bet you most of them never saw their dad on their knees in a church before a tabernacle. Hmm. This ain't rocket science. So if we want to correct these things and so many other aspects we could go into and unpack all day and for weeks, we got to get fatherhood back. Rightly and properly understood, not an ogre, not a caveman, woman, make me breakfast, not that nonsense, a sacrificial man. Like Jesus, primarily, the ultimate man, the God man, and then like St. Joseph, the one that Jesus himself wanted to imitate. We got to bring him back. So as I was thinking about how do I do this, what do I do, that's when things in my research and prayer started to come to me like, okay, why? 
has he been presented for centuries as an old man. This is not in the scriptures. As a matter of fact, you Louisianans should be super proud that you got a dude in your land named Dr. Brant Petrie who is unpacking this stuff right now in phenomenal ways, my friends. You need to Google that dude tonight and watch his videos where he is, this stuff came out after my book was published. Bummer, right? It would have been great if it was in it, but he's probably gonna write a book on it and it's gonna be amazing. We're right in the scriptures itself, divine revelation. Not Father Calloway, not somebody over here. In the Bible itself, we actually can know how old St. Joseph was. It's been under our noses for 2,000 years and we missed it. We missed it. How? Well, this brilliant biblical scholar, he, he goes in, he, he, I'm not going to go through the whole thing tonight because it's very detailed, you've got to know Greek and stuff, but he, words that are used when we're talking about the man, Simeon, the man, Joseph, different words in Greek are used. And in first century Judaism, this uh, Philo of Alexandria made in a book a description of what words are used in Greek to describe age brackets for Judaism. The word that's used to describe Joseph, the man betrothed to Mary in Greek, describes an age bracket. It's like between 25 and I think it's 35 or 37 or something like that. Whoa! That's amazing! So then why did people, even from the beginning of the church, say that he was old, sometimes super old? There's even traditions in Egypt, Coptic traditions, that he was like 98 when he espoused Our Lady. Seriously, I thought the point was not to stand out. You think people ain't going to notice that? That's a little, yo, yo, bro, yo, funky, right? Even back then, that was like, that ain't normal, okay? So why? Why did they depict him as old? Here's the reality. This is the stuff that is legend. This is not inspired stuff. It's called apocryphal literature. It can be beneficial. We can get some very interesting information from these apocryphal uh, writings, so they're not to be entirely condemned, but they're not inspired by the Holy Spirit, they're not sacred scripture, and they're people basically just coming up with ideas to fill in the gap. The hidden years of the Holy Family, we don't have a lot. We got the birth, we got the finding of the temple, the loss in the temple, and that's about it. They went to Egypt. We ain't got a lot of filler. So people started to come up with things. One of those was, how is it possible? How is it possible for a man to live with the most beautiful woman to walk the planet, the dove of God, the book that basically the Song of Songs was written for, this all-holy Theotokos, God-bearer, the Madonna, the new Eve, the mother of all the living. How is it possible for a man to live with such a woman and not have desires of the flesh and not want to consummate that marriage? It's impossible, they said. Therefore, he's 95. I'm serious. I am serious. That is the only reason. And it stuck, especially in the Eastern traditions. And I get it. We have to defend Our Lady's virginity. This, her perpetual virginity is a dogma of our faith. We should defend this to our death. But you don't have to depict St. Joseph as an old man about to croak, right? No, actually it's more virtuous for a young man to practice chastity in his eyes, his intentions, in his heart when you're living with the most beautiful woman ever. You know, they say that St. Catherine of Siena was so beautiful and she knew it, right? That's why she had to cut her hair and she would like do all kinds of stuff to try and get men to stop paying attention to her because she was attractive. They say that on occasion, sometimes she would have to have seven priests follow her as she went through the streets because people would see her and they would pass out from her beauty. That's St. Catherine of Siena. She got nothing on Our Lady. Imagine the beauty of Our Lady. You know, St. Joseph, if, if, if I always say this, I got a lot of this stuff from Fulton Sheen because he's just so amazing. I'm, I'm a total plagiarist when it comes to Fulton Sheen, you know? I don't think he minds though, right? <laughs> he talks about how God made his own mother. Jesus made his own mom. He's going to make her perfect. God the Father made his own daughter, Our Lady. What a beautiful daughter, right? His little princess. Raises her up to be the queen of the cosmos. The Holy Spirit made his own bride, the Immaculata. 
Well, wouldn't Jesus also do the same thing in regard to his father, his earthly father? It's not going to be his biological father, so he's not going to be an immaculate conception. It's not going to be the, the new Adam. That's Jesus. Our lady's the new Eve. Jesus is the new Adam. But he's going to be a special creature. Wouldn't he make him, like, super good? Handsome, even? Sure. Who wants to have an ugly dad? <laughs> Think. Right? We haven't been thinking of this right. We just think, you know, he's in, put him in the back, put him in the back. No. A lot of saints in more modern times have talked about this. He most likely was a, a handsome man. He probably was not the same age as Our Lady, right? Tradition usually says Our Lady was around 16 or so, somewhere around there. So he would have been, you know, maybe 25, Eamon Young, maybe 35 at the most, somewhere in that range. A lot of mystics say 30 or 33. Venerable Mary of Agreda, Blessed Anne Catherine Emmerich, a whole bunch of mystics in the tradition. But I know people get, oh, but that's private revelation. Okay, fine, that's fine. But remember, in the Bible itself now, we can know the age bracket. Amazing stuff in our times. The saints of old did not know this stuff like it's being revealed to us today. Why? Because they didn't have the crises that we have today when it comes to marriage and family and the gender issues and all this stuff. We need this. Saint Joseph, who are you? We need to know you. We need you today. We're so confused. Help us to return to common sense and to reason and to apply these things. And that's what the Holy Trinity is doing in our times. You know, a lot of people will say, too, well, what's wrong with St. Joseph having been a, a widower? Why couldn't he have had a previous marriage and children from that previous marriage? Okay, on one level, technically, there's nothing wrong with that, right? Many of you, that may be the case for you. And having a, 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 a marriage like that can be a great blessing for everybody involved. There's nothing wrong with that. But again, if you're going to be creating for your son, a man to raise him. You want that man to be strong. And yet, a man who can swing an axe, who can walk to Jerusalem three times a year for decades, required by Jewish law. Do the math. Let's just say 30 years. Do the math. St. Joseph walked three-fourths of the way around the planet. As Mother Angelica said, old men don't walk to Egypt. And they don't walk back either. That's a one-way trip. Okay? They ain't got Uber, right? No, in all likelihood, he was a lot younger than he's been depicted. And that is something remarkable to think about. So, okay, technically there's nothing wrong with him having been a widower and had other children, but is that the teaching of the Catholic Church? No, it's not. Is it a strong tradition in the Eastern churches? It is, it is, you know, can't, can't deny that. But is it a dogmatic teaching? Is it a doctrinal teaching? No, it's not. As a matter of fact, there is a very long teaching. If you get the book, you'll read all the quotes I got in there, and there's more that I don't have in the book. Affirmed by popes, the vicar of Christ, that he was a virgin himself. And how right and proper it is that like Mary's like, that holy marriage, it's in so many prayers. In our liturgy, even, we talk about this. Very interesting, my friends. Because when you see him that way, then young boys in this filthy, perverse, pornographic era that we live in can realize that I, too, can be young, strong, and yet I can treat women with dignity. They're not my object to be used and abused for my pleasure. I am to protect, defend, and die for that beautiful feminine mystery that's been given to me, entrusted to me. This is another reason why we need St. Joseph depicted as younger, stronger, and alive. This is why we need this today. You know, there were certain saints that picked up on this in church history. Church fathers at the beginning, they didn't talk much about St. Joseph in homilies dealing with Christmas uh, or various aspects of the lost in the temple things. You know, they would mention him here and there and talk about his virtues and him being just, of course, and that's a whole other thing we can unpack because it's a very unique title for him. But certain saints, they picked up on this. But they weren't theologians. Like St. Teresa of Avila, probably one of the greatest devotees of St. Joseph. She was so devoted to him, attributed to him so many miraculous things in her life. In her famous autobiography, if you want to be a saint, by the way, write an autobiography. You probably got a good shot at it, right? So many of them write a diary and then they you know, get canonized later on. So don't jack it up, though. Make it a holy one. You know, you got to do some good stuff in there. 
She said that she's never gone to St. Joseph and been disappointed. She said that other saints, you go to them for a particular need. And you know this. You lose your car keys, who do you pray to? Right. Somebody's got cancer, you pray to St. Peregrine. Right, you know how it goes, right? But St. Joseph is our father, she said. Our spiritual father. And you go to your father with every need. With everything. And she challenged the readers of her, her diary, her autobiography, to a test. The challenge of St. Teresa of Avila. She said, don't take my word for it. If you don't believe me, try it for yourself. You know, one of her friends, pretty much attributed as the greatest mystic of the church, St. John of the Cross. He didn't get it. He testified that he didn't get it. He didn't understand St. Joseph. And yet St. Joseph is the, the master of the hidden life. And he took his friend up on her challenge. And then he got it. He understood the greatness, the hiddenness, the holiness of St. Joseph. And how Jesus and Mary depended upon him to get them to the cross. He who would not even be there without him, Jesus and Mary wouldn't have made it. He's the one who was able to get them there. That is so amazing, so profound. Other saints throughout history that I could name, probably many you've not even heard of, incredible saints, they tried to bring in aspects of St. Joseph. A lot of it was more devotional than theological. A field of theology called Josephology did not really come into existence until like the 16th century, and even then it was basic, it was rudimentary, it wasn't deep. But you know, all this stuff only really kicked in in modern times. In our time, for us, Specifically, we can pinpoint when you could call it an era, an age of St. Joseph began in the, in the church, in her history, 1870. So yes, you know, 150 years ago, but in church time, that's not much compared to 2,000 years, but it's been building and crescendoing, and we just lived through something extraordinary, the year of St. Joseph. So what happened in 1870 that triggered this, that got the ball rolling. I call it, I know y'all don't get snow here, but you know what it is, so right? You throw a snowball down a hill, it gains speed, momentum, and mass, and it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger, right? So in 1870, a holy pope, blessed Pius IX, declared St. Joseph the patron of the universal church. What does that mean? Patron comes from pater, it means father. Now, women can be patrons too, but in that sense, it means parental, right? St. Therese of Lisieux, the patroness of the missions, and so forth. Yes, parental, right? Well, patron, pater, father. St. Joseph is our father. Wow. You know, that was a revelation to a lot of people. Because we've always known that Our Lady is our spiritual mother. But think it through. If we are brothers and sisters of Jesus, and we are, we're sons in the Son. We're sons and daughters in His Sonship. And we can cry out, Abba, Father. If we don't have the same parents that He has, it's a funky family. <laughs> but it ain't a funky family. It's very clear that He gave us Our Lady from the cross. But He left it to the church to unpack that we also have St. Joseph as our spiritual father. He's the father of the mystical body as well. We are members of the mystical body. We are brothers and sisters of Jesus. Wow. So when the Pope declared that, do you know what heaven did? Heaven responded. When the Pope, as the vicar of Christ, does something like he did in 1870, graces flow. Only a few years after that papal declaration, that was 1870, in 1879, do you know what happened? St. Joseph came in an apparition. Unheard of! St. Joseph? No, that's usually Our Lady with three children in a, in a grotto somewhere herding sheep. <laughs> you know, that's how that goes down. By the way, if you want to have an apparition, have three kids near a grotto, you know, you got a good shot at it, right? That's how it works generally, you know. <laughs> I'm just saying, it seems to be the pattern. So, but here we have St. Joseph, but he didn't come alone. And guess where he came? Anybody want to take a shot at it? Do you, where? Ireland, right. Ireland, knock Ireland. That's amazing, right? So, in 1879, there was a famine, and they were really hurting, the people were really suffering, and 15 people on a rainy day, Ireland, saw this vision for hours and hours. Our Lady was there, St. Joseph was there, standing next to her with his head bowed like in reverence to his wife, to his bride. Beautiful, right? How beautiful. St. John the Evangelist and a lamb on the altar. They saw an altar with a lamb, literally a lamb, depicting our Lord. Nobody said anything. 
None of the heavenly visitors said a word. Man, if I would have been one of those 15, I would have been like, speak, man, we've been waiting. You never said nothing, Joseph. Say something. <laughs> you got a chance, man. You know, he didn't say nothing. Classic St. Joseph. They didn't need to say anything because their mere presence was a comfort to the people. They were starving at that time. That's a fully approved apparition. St. Joseph, that's extraordinary. Shortly after that, not long after that, still in, I think it was 1889, so uh, 10 years later, Pope Leo XIII wrote the first official papal encyclical on St. Joseph. That's a really important document by a pope. And I have to say, as a priest, it's embarrassing. Why? Because it took the church 1,889 years to crank out a document on St. Joseph. But it's a humdinger, man. That document, that encyclical, it is amazing what the Pope said in that document. Off the charts. Do you know what happened shortly after that? When the Pope does something, heaven responds with grace. St. Joseph came again. Anybody want to take a shot at where this one was? Fatima. Fatima, Portugal. Now you're probably thinking, oh, this Father Calloway, what seminary did he go to? That was Our Lady, Father. Yes, and primarily so. She's greater than St. Joseph, right? But she brought St. Joseph. This is part of the approved apparitions of, Saint, uh, of Fatima. At the last apparition, the famous one, October 13th, where the sun spun, 70,000 plus people saw the sun gyrate in the sky as a sign that the kids weren't lying. After that, all three children testified and said they saw in the heavens St. Joseph holding the Christ child, and together, father and son, Joseph and Jesus, blessed the world. Wow, that's the forgotten aspect of the Fatima apparitions. If you love Fatima like I do, you long for the triumph of Our Lady's Immaculate Heart, especially today, right? With the crises going on in the world, my goodness, do we need Our Lady's triumph, because that means the, the reign of Christ the King. It's all about Jesus. But we're never going to experience the triumph of her Immaculate Heart unless we get the family right. It's the building block of civilization. How could Our Lady's be, heart be rejoicing today when almost half of all marriages end in divorce today? When the majority of Christian Catholic couples practice contraception? Is her heart rejoicing in this? I don't think so. We gotta get dad back. We gotta get the strength, we gotta get order back. We gotta bring him back. Sister Lucia dos Santos, the, the oldest of those visionaries, remember? She lived to be like 100 or something. I always say she got the short end of that stick, right? The other ones were canonized kids. She's like, hello. <laughs> I was there too, right? All right, you'll get there, sister, right? She's working on it. She's on phase two, I think. She's servant of God. She might be venerable now, I forget. But so anyway, she said later in life as a nun to a cardinal that the final battle between good and evil would be fought over ecology? <laughs> no. <laughs> What? Marriage and family. Marriage and family. Because that's the bedrock, the foundation of it all. If that crumbles, it all crumbles. That's why we've got to bring in St. Joseph today. That's what is needed in the church, the, the family unit. It's what's needed in society, the family unit and its importance, right? So, as we go through the century, more things happen. We get the litany of St. Joseph approved by St. Pope Pius X at a beautiful prayer. Right? It's, the, it's the template for the book that I wrote on consecration. And then we get a new feast day to St. Joseph on May 1st, coming up. The one that your state legislature declared as, as, as a celebration for all Louisianans now on May 1st every year. And that was to help us overcome the threat of communism in the mid 20th century, which, which was a re very real threat because they wanted to take over what was just a celebration of workers and make it Communist Workers Day, but the Pope stepped down and he said, yeah, not today, we're gonna have St. Joseph the worker. Hey, I like that. But today, sadly, it's coming back. In the education today, the young people are so fascinated by socialism and all of its variants, right? And they walk around with their shirts of Che Guevara, no idea what that dude really stood for, clueless, because that's what their teachers are teaching them. No idea. You keep that mentality up, you're going to be the breadline soon, homie. Because you think this is a hero. You're clueless. We need St. Joseph to come back today to correct all these other heads from this hydra, this wicked hydra. It's got many heads, not just one, a whole bunch of them. We need them back again. And then we got St. Joseph's name put in the mass. 
My friends, do you know that it was not until 1962 that St. Joseph's name was in the greatest of all prayers, the Holy Mass? Again, for me, that's kind of embarrassing as a priest. It took the church 1,962 years to put his name in that prayer. Wow. And it's a long story of how it got there, but it's an inspiring story, a very inspiring story. Do you know what saints of old would have done to have heard that? St. Teresa of Avila? She didn't get to hear that when she walked on this earth. Other, 100 years ago, like St. Andre Bassett, up in Canada, humble little brother, wasn't even a priest, built the world's largest basilica dedicated to St. Joseph, the great oratory of St. Joseph. Oh, what a place. If you ever get a chance, go see that in Montreal. It's amazing. He didn't get to hear St. Joseph's name in the Mass. He died before 1962. You get to hear it every Sunday, and if you're able to go to Mass every day, every day, right after Our Lady is now St. Joseph. What a blessing, my friends, that we have in our times to call upon him, to ask for his intercession, to help us, to help us to increase in virtue, to increase in holiness, to turn away from the bad things and turn to the good. That's what a father does. That's what a good father does. And we need good fathers today, both secular fathers and good fathers like priests. Have we not experienced a crisis where we've heard about scandalous, criminal things by our spiritual fathers? They too need to look to St. Joseph as a model of what it means to be a father. The beauty is not at your disposal to do with her what you want. The church is not at my disposal. She is my bride. I have no right to abuse her, take advantage of her, and, 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 and do what I want. No, I am to protect, to defend, and to slay the dragon for the beauty entrusted to me your souls. I need to look to St. Joseph to learn how to be a good man. No man is going to have a greater model. You know, today we hold up the sports figures. I get it. They can hit a ball out of a field. Cool. Bravo. Right? Nice. But are you virtuous? That's the path to sanctity. Virtue is the way you get to heaven, my friends. We need St. Joseph to help us in this matter. And you know, I'll, I'll wrap it up with this. We have been so blessed in our lifetime. All of you here, I can say this with total conviction. Many of you weren't here in 1962 like I wasn't, right? I came a decade after that. But all of you were here just a couple years ago when we experienced the first ever year of St. Joseph in the history of the Catholic Church. What a blessing. Now, how did that come about? Something absolutely extraordinary. Now, this is so humbling to me. As I was inspired by the Holy Spirit to put this consecration to St. Joseph program together. In my research, it dawned upon me, hold on a minute, 1870, 2020, that's the 150th anniversary year of when the Pope made that declaration. In this time of crisis, and I had no idea COVID was coming, just like you didn't know this whole thing was gonna lock down the world. I didn't see that coming, but God did. But I saw that time frame and I said, you know what? I'm gonna publish my book on January 1st, 2020, in honor of that 150th anniversary. And I thought to myself, we need to have a year of St. Joseph. Somehow, we got to make this happen. But how? I don't know the Pope. I ain't got a cell phone. Yo, what's up? You know, how was your day? <laughs> I don't know that dude, right? So I'm like, okay, how do we do this? Because I had heard about in the past that people would write letters to the Pope to ask him that the faithful were really excited about this, you know, proclaim this about Our Lady or about this aspect or something. And, and many times, he would do it, not because they were like forcing, like, do whatever, we're going to come over and beat you up, Pope, no. But he too, as the Vicar of Christ, was inspired and this confirmed it and he, and he would do things. So I thought, I'm going to write him a letter. So I wrote a letter, one pager, a couple paragraphs in English. He don't know English, not that well anyway, right? He, he knows English like I know Klingon, you know, it, it, I don't know a whole lot of Klingon, you know? So I was like, all right, that ain't going to work. I'm going to mail this thing. Some little Italian sister's going to get it right back a letter, grazie mille, for your letter. He ain't even going to see this thing. So I asked a brother priest in Argentina, where the Pope is from, because my community's there. I said, Father Dante, translate this for me into Spanish, right? Real good churchy Spanish. Like, do it up real good, man. Make it look real nice, you know? <laughs> so he did. And then he said to me, this is amazing. This was on when I sent him my... English version. This was May 1st, 2019. I, he wrote me back and he said, sure, I'll do it, no problem. He said, but I got another proposition. He said, my friend, a bishop from Argentina is in Rome right now. 
He's there for his, they call it the ad limen of his, the bishops go there like every five years to check in with the Pope. Hey, how you doing? How are things going right? So his friend, a bishop, was in Rome. And he said, Father, can I text my, my friend, the bishop, and ask him if he will present your letter to the Holy Father tomorrow when he meets with them? And I was like, totally, do it, beg him, right? That'd be amazing. And the bishop agreed. The bishop agreed to do this. And so on May 2nd, 2019, Bishop um, Hector Zordon from the diocese, this cracks me up, his diocese is called Gualiguachu. <laughs> it's funny to me. It's like you tickle a kid, Gualiguachu, Gualiguachu, right? <laughs> I don't think it means anything in Spanish, right? Gualiguachu. <laughs> so, yeah. So he presented my letter to the bishop in English and Spanish. And they talked about it. We have the pictures from this papal photographer called Le Sovereign Romano, right? They, they talked about my letter. And I'm like, oh my goodness, this is amazing. It's going down, man, right? It's going to happen. I didn't hear nothing. <laughs> I was waiting, checking the mail every day. Nothing. The church is like molasses, trust me. Well, it moves so slow, like, eh, it takes forever, right? So I'm like, all right, I ain't got time to wait for them. They'll get around to it someday. So I started to write to every bishop in the United States a letter. And I said, you have the, the authority in your diocese to declare a year of St. Joseph. Please do it for this anniversary year. My book's coming out. You know, it's, it's going to be an amazing year. Please do it. I got 11 to do it up until what? December 8th, 2020. What happened on that day? The Pope declared a year of St. Joseph for the entire Catholic Church around the world. That's amazing, man. That is, I'm like, you know, that, who, who, who does that? But he did. And I'm not, I'm not saying it was because of my letter, because he still hasn't written me. <laughs> Yo, you know where I am? You know? No, that's cool. He still hasn't written me. It doesn't matter. I don't need a trophy. I don't need, no. It was about making St. Joseph more known and loved, accomplishing the mission, and that has happened, my friends. St. Joseph is now everywhere. New artwork. I commissioned two of your people from Louisiana to, to paint paintings for me for my book. Incredible paintings and other people around the world. New statues are coming into existence that show St. Joseph as strong, young, handsome, alive. That's great. That's fantastic, right? There's a renewal of love for St. Joseph because God knew what he was doing. Father Calloway didn't. I had no idea. I wanted the Pope to declare a Saint jo year of St. Joseph on May 3rd when he got my letter, you know? No, God had a plan. When my book came out on January 1st, 2020, what happened right after that? The whole world shut down in March. I was so excited. I'm pumping it up. I'm like, Solemnity of St. Joseph's coming up. Let's consecrate parishes. Let's do this. It's going to be amazing. Oh, crash and burn. The whole, the whole world shut down. I'm like, dang. That didn't work. You know? So I kept praying, but people started getting the book. And they said to me, they still do today. A lady said this to me today before I came in here tonight. Father, your book got me through 2020. Do you know how many people found comfort and hope in rediscovering the love of their spiritual father during a time when many people lost their jobs, were worried and so anxious about what is happening on this planet with this lockdown stuff? So much anxiety. You know this. We all live through it. And then at the end of the year, December 8th, the Pope declared the year of St. Joseph, and the entire Catholic world said this, is there a book on St. Joseph? <laughs> yeah, baby, right? Got it right here. Ready to go. And the translations kicked in. Now it's in 18 languages. Do you know what the last language it was translated in and is in, but it hasn't been circulated because it can't? Ukrainian. Mm-hmm. Yep, I, I, I haven't had a copy. Why? Because I don't believe I, the places, who knows? It was done. They were sending me pictures with the press and everything. And I have pictures of it in Ukrainian. It's a beautiful copy of what they did. The ribbons they put it in, very, very nice. But I've been emailing them. They don't respond back. I'm not worried about the book at that point. I'm like, are you guys okay? No response. We need St. Joseph, my friends. You need him. Your marriage needs him. Your jacked up family needs him. I always tell people, don't, I'm not Padre Pio, I'm not reading souls, right? I went to see Sister Dulce the other day. I was freaking out. They told me she read souls. I was like, uh-oh. <laughs> you ever hear about her? Yeah, I was freaking out. I wanted to find a priest and go to confession right before I went in and be like, you got nothing on me. I'm clean as a whistle. <laughs> you know? Got nothing. Anyway. 
So I'm going to challenge you. This is your homework. I'm going to leave you with homework, okay? Now, I don't make money off the sales of the book. I'm in a religious community. All that goes to my community. My superiors are really happy, right? We've sold over a million copies worldwide, so they're, they're quite delighted. They're like, write more books, <laughs> you know? I want to challenge you to do the program. The year of St. Joseph is over, it is true, but St. Joseph, we're not putting him back in the closet. It's not like going back in the shadows, no. He's here to stay now in a big way. I challenge you, like St. Teresa of Avila challenged her audience that read her, her autobiography. I challenge you as your brother and as a priest. Do this consecration program. It takes about 20 minutes a day, sometimes 30 minutes, for 33 days. You will come to know St. Joseph, I guarantee you, like you've never known him before. You will learn about the wedding ring, the Santo Anello, that still exists in the cathedral in Perugia, Italy, housed in a gigantic reliquary. It's the wedding ring that St. Joseph gave to his beauty, to his bride, Our Lady's wedding ring. It's still there, about 30 minutes from Assisi, but hardly anybody knows about it. Look it up. You learn about the Holy House of Loreto, that in the 13th century, God sent his angels to relocate to Italy. Not a legend. You get these modernists saying, oh, it's a legend, you know, it's some family named DeAngelis. Loser, right? No. <laughs> Affirmed by popes and saints. Give you a litany of saints who have gone there. St. Therese herself went there when her dad walked her to Rome to see Pope Leo XIII to try and enter Carmel. And she said it was an enchanting experience to go to the Holy House where Jesus, Mary, and Joseph lived in Nazareth. It was taken in the 13th century to Italy because a few years later, Muslims came through Nazareth and sacked the entire town, leveled it. The Holy Family's home, this great relic, would have been destroyed. God said, not today, and moved it. It's in Loretto, Italy to this day. You'll learn about all these things. So that's my homework for you, okay? So I'll be signing and selling books afterwards, and if you can't stick around, fine, you can buy it somewhere else, whatever. Just do it. Do it. You need it. You need to go to Joseph. And I'll end with this because another, you, Louisianans are awesome. I love you people. I'm coming out with another book co-authored by one of your own, Scott Smith. Well, Scott, where are you? Where's Scott? I know I'm gonna, he's going to be humbled by this. Stand up, brother. So this good man here is co-authoring with me another book. Thanks, brother. So he's actually done the bulk of the work. I'm just riding his wave at this point. He used the template for the consecration. It's going to be consecration to St. Joseph for children and families. Yeah, it's going to be sweet stuff. So pray for Scott and I. It's going to come out probably this summer sometime. It's going to be really, really nice. So I'm going to give you a blessing. And after that, don't leave because they have some other announcements. But it's an honor for me to be with you good people that I love so much and, and, and to pray for you and to give you a priestly blessing. So please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Heavenly Father, in this great month of St. Joseph, the month of March, we pray for his paternal cloak to be over us, to protect us, our families, to help us to undergo a deeper conversion, to help us as the increaser to increase in virtue, to grow closer to Jesus and Mary and our holy faith. We pray for conversions among our family members, that those who are away would come to know your love, your mercy, your greatness, your glory, and come to be with you in the sacraments. We pray for those who need healing of mind and of body, of spirit, those who are suffering anxiety and stress because of the times. Give them peace. Oh, good St. Joseph, you are our spiritual father. You raised the Messiah. You saved him from Herod. You were a good, holy, pure husband for the Immaculata, be our Father. Be with us all our days and help us to experience a holy and a happy death just like you did in the arms of Jesus and Mary. And I give this blessing, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.